Hey everyone, today uh, we've got Emmett Peppers and Matt Smith uh, from Good Soil Investment here to talk about uh, some of the names that, that are in their portfolio. Um, Emmett's been on Sum Zero for a while and he was actually one of uh, the few um, Tesla bulls on, on, on Sum Zero. And I think as, as most people um, realize at this point, Tesla is obviously uh, a controversial name, especially controversial in, in the in the buy side community. Um, Many on the buy side would, would sort of uh, consider it to be a you know a, a strong short. Um, Michael Burry actually maybe is the most most famous <laughs> for being for being uh, aggressively short Tesla at various points in time. Um, Emmett, you you posted along on some zero on Tesla. I think it was like late 2020, yeah. back when he was trading in the 400s. Uh, yeah. I think at the time you had a target of 800 and change. Um, you, you know, you, you closed out your position, at least on some zero, um, when it was somewhere in the 800s, but I gather based on some of the other interviews you, you've done, you, you, you've been sort of in and out of the name, um, throughout 2021. Um, so I think maybe as a starting point, um, uh, walk us through your Tesla bull thesis. I mean, there's, there's Tesla the trade, but there's there's the fundamental business, and I, I'm just curious if you have, just from a yeah. fundamental standpoint, a, a view on the business itself, um, having looked at the competition yeah. uh, in the broader electrification space. Yeah, uh, thanks, Divya, for the intro. Yeah, so in uh, November 2020, when the S&P announced their uh, inclusion of Tesla, that was kind of a moment. Uh, many of us longtime Tesla bulls were waiting for. And I posted some research on some zero uh, at that time. I think our site, our, our fund had just kind of signed up to some zero and posted our, uh, our, our thesis that we thought the stock could get to 700 to 800 plus by January. And uh, so we bought a bunch of call options and um, had a nice return on those, uh, selling them, I think, when Tesla was around $872 a share in January. So um, and, and it, I just just to kind of get a better sense of good soils like investing framework a little bit. Are you do you typically take directional views through options or do you do, are you more? I mean, is that is that your yeah. kind of MO or, or do you do you typically buy the cash equity as a way we do to a mix? You do yeah, a mix. we do a mix and we don't we, we know we're kind of um, best ideas fund and given my kind of unique background uh, working with hundreds of uh, emerging hedge fund managers at interactive brokers as a sales rep there until 2020, I felt like I got a lot of exposure of a lot of different investing strategies and um, learned a lot of different uh, tools to use to potentially exacerbate returns on, on things. So options, are a, a main tool of ours, but we do go long stocks or short stocks um, as well. Um, but options are a big part of our return and we're very uh, risky, our strategy, um, and we you know, are upfront about that and our returns can be very volatile as a result. But Tesla is our highest conviction name by far. Um, the biggest position we have in our fund is around Tesla. A little bit of the stock, but a lot of options. Um, and so we've done quite well. Can you quantify that? Yeah, uh, I mean, I think we did a delta dollars versus all the other delta dollars exposure of the other stocks. You know, others, we're, we're very concentrated. There's like four or five names that make up 80% of our, our fund. And then uh, Tesla is probably half of our funds exposure wow. at this moment. It hasn't always been, you know, a year a year ago, or not a year ago, but like eight months ago, it might have been 25% of our funds exposure. But because Tesla has gone up and we've gotten more right. bullish in the last eight or nine months, we've added to some of our Tesla uh, long-term calls as well, which have done well. Um, but at this moment, it's a large percentage of our, our funds exposure. Um, I don't know if it's 50%, don't quote me on that, but it's 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 close oh, to that. Yeah. And, and, and how, big is the, how big is the fund at this point? Uh, I think we're... I mean, as of the end of the third quarter, uh, we were at 33 or 33 million. We took on some yeah. investor capital. And as of today, we're close to like 40 million uh, right now. So 
we're, we're growing. We're still kind of in the emerging manager space. We hope to get to a hundred million plus sometime next year. Um, and uh, we'll see where it goes from there. That's yeah, but- exciting. I mean, and, and you, you, you only, I mean, how long ago did you start Good Soil? Yeah, we started it. I started as an incubator fund actually uh, while I was still employed with Interactive Brokers with just a hundred thousand dollars of my own capital back in January of of twenty twenty, January first of twenty twenty, and that hundred thousand uh, dollars grew, believe it or not, to over thirteen million dollars by the end of twenty twenty. That was just my own capital, so it was a ridiculous return because I was low on Tesla options. I shorted the. Um, index put, I, I bought a bunch of index puts on, on the NASDAQ uh, ETF, QQQ, right before the COVID crash. And I closed those out at the low and bought a bunch of long-term uh, call options on Square, Peloton, Palo Alto wow. Network. I just did like the perfect setup. I mean, that type of return will never happen again. We make sure our investors know that, but it's a nice headline number. <laughs> yeah, what, what, a great, what a great launch. That's amazing. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's such a great like American story right there also. Um, yeah. So, yeah. so, okay. So getting back to Tesla, I mean, it sounds like that was a big, big part of your overall returns. What, yeah. what do you have like today, kind of a, a long-term viewpoint um, on Tesla, uh, you know, and I, I feel like, the, I mean, the reason why people tend to be bearish about the name is, you know, the automotive industry is so competitive, um, you know, margins are tight. Uh, and we're starting to see, you know, between Porsche with the Taycan and Volkswagen with, with their, what is it called? The ID4 or something like that. Yeah, uh, yeah ID4. In Europe, there's a lot of stuff going on. And in the U.S., um, you know, there, there's, uh, there's competition as well. And not, nothing that's kind of hit mainstream. Like, I think, at least in my head, the, the sort of moment where Tesla shareholders like, have to kind of really ask themselves the hard question is like when there's a model three competitor that's priced, you know, squarely at the model three made by call it a Toyota or, or a Ford or, um, you know, a GM, like kind of a a mainstream automaker right now there isn't, but um, Mm -hmm. do you factor that into your just fundamental thesis on whether they can hit the sort of, you know, production numbers they're targeting in the next call it, you know, that, that two to five year time horizon. Yeah, sure. And, you know, this would be a good time to introduce Matt Smith, my partner who I took on in February, March, mainly because of his Tesla knowledge and analysis on all this stuff. Uh, we're both like-minded and um, Matt, uh, do you want to maybe go into some answer, some of Divya's question there? Yeah. So I, I can, you know, take a crack at that. It, it's essentially that that's been, I, th- I think one of the corners of kind of the, the Tesla bear thesis for the last 10 years, really, um, you know, is that, oh, the, comp- the competition is coming and, you know, Tesla can never grow. And then if they do grow, they, they won't really do so uh, at profitable margins. And even if they do, their valuation is so high already that, um, you know, like they, they're already priced to perfection. This, this has really been kind of like the core um, short thesis forever. And in fact, I was uh, a, a kind of a fan of Tesla for a long time, but I wouldn't invest just because I, I didn't like the valuation. Um, but around, you know, 2018, 2019, uh, the 2018, I think I actually, uh, they, they had their autonomy day event where, you know, they essentially outlined a path for um, an autonomous future. And that's where, you know, Tesla at the time trading around a $50 billion market cap, um, everyone pretty much dismissed Elon's ambitions around, you know, launching a, a, a robo taxi network. They just said, like, it's, you know, he's a showman. Um, he's not really serious about this. Um, but if you look at the, at the um, resources they're kind of devoting to solve this problem, you can criticize, you know, wh- whether they'll actually achieve it or not. Um, but there, there's certainly um, upside, what I would call optionality with Tesla, if they are able to um, solve that. So, so that was one of the turning points for me as someone who was, I, I think, critical of Tesla's valuation to say, okay, you know, even if there's only a 10% chance that they, they launch this, if they do, you know, my math at the time was that it would be worth around $3,000 per share kind of incrementally to, to where Tesla was at the time. This is pre-split, so you got to, you know, kind of adjust for that. Um, but so, so that kind of got me thinking around, um, you know, Tesla's ability to uh, kind of leapfrog the, the industry uh, by having software or software like margins rather than kind of hardware like margins. 
Um, so, so you mentioned Divya, the, you know, the kind of margins are tight and competition is strong. Um, but what's really surprised me, I think in the last year or two is Tesla has been, you know, ramping production like crazy. I mean, they're going to be at roughly 90% growth rate in deliveries this year compared to last year. Um, and, and on and kind of a, that backdrop, they're, they're producing automotive gross margins of, of 30% or more um, at scale now. Um, and there's, they're still ramping. So, so to be able to have those sorts of, uh, of margins at, at a time when, you know, uh, they're actually raising prices because demand is stretched out almost six months. Um, and they're really, like you said, there's, there's actually not competition for them right now. You know, I, I think there's, there's going to be plenty of, of space for other, you know, competitors to succeed, you know, in the electric space. Tesla's not going to have 100% market share. But I think, I think the, the thing a lot of shorts miss is, you know, the, the real competition is all ICE vehicles. It's not, you know, electric. Because electric vehicles are going to continue to decrease in cost. Um, and, and they'll end up displacing, you know, internal combustion engine vehicle sales. Um, so I, I think, you know, a lot of the, the shorts are, are kind of looking at Tesla through the lens of like financial analysis on auto companies, which trade at like uh, an EBITDA multiple of like five or 10. So uh, I think that's the wrong way to look at things. And, and Tesla's, you know, incredibly high growth rate top line and incredibly strong margins on the bottom line, uh, as well as kind of that optionality that I referenced where you, you've got new business lines like energy, like autonomy um, and, and some of the stuff like people will probably laugh at right now, but like Tesla bot, They've got all these, you know, um, they're kind of like an incubator of, of new technologies that if if they pan out, have kind of drastic share price implications. Yeah, the, the most interesting thing you said was the incremental like value, I guess, for a per share for a robo taxi. So you mentioned it, you'd expect a $3,000 per share value would make sense for like a, a robo taxi business. Like where do you, how do you get to that? Yeah, so that was an analysis I did about two years ago, and that was you know pre-split, so you know six hundred dollar per share in price uh, today. Got but it. if I were to, I actually kind of refreshed this a little bit earlier this year, and it's it's closer to like fifteen hundred dollars um, share price implication on you know today's share price. So you know really really uh, drastic implications. Um, you know, but but the the basic math is Tesla is pursuing a super low cost autonomy. You know, a vision only. A hardware stack. So they're going to, they have, um, you know, essentially the entire 1 million plus fleet of vehicles um, would be capable of, you know, achieving like basically being an Uber, but without a driver. So you, you know, you just say, you know, what some percentage of those uh, will be in the network and then they'll, they'll, they'd have to undercut Uber and Lyft. So say it's a dollar 50 per mile that would be charged versus, you know, roughly $3 for Uber and Lyft. Um, and it's just a discounted cash flow analysis. So you say, all right, you know, prices will continue to come down because if you're going to expand market share, you need to kind of account for declining prices. And then Tesla has, has said they want to have a platform fee of around 30%. So, you know, Tesla just gets this kind of recurring margin on the, the fleet of vehicles. So, so that the are idea is that like for the fleet, the million cars you're referencing here would just be, these would be owned by people who own Tesla cars, but they would opt in. Mm -hmm. to this, to this robo taxi feature. Um, and, and they would share a percent of those, let's say, you know, those, 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 those dollars that get charged to Tesla and it's it, right. So it's, is that what you're kind of, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, kind of like an, an Uber type, um, you know, business model, but, but, you know, if you actually think through the implications of, of Tesla's cost structure and the fact that, you know, the single greatest expense that you know Uber and Lyft have is, is drivers, and then after that it's, it's gasoline uh, for, for those yeah. drivers, at least from a customer pocket. And Tesla is getting rid of the most expensive one, and they're you know the cost per mile in electric is somewhere between a third and a half of a, a comparable gasoline mile. So so you can just drastically undercut compet uh, competitors' pricing um, while lowering uh, the price to the to the customer. Yeah. Um, so, so that allows for, you know, kind of huge pie expansion, um, even kind of within the confines of, of the current market, that the margins would be crazy. And, and like how many years out do you, do you think this is? It, it's, it's at least two, I would say right now, um, different people have, have different view and, and, you know, it's, 
this is why I kind of view it as like an uh, optionality. I mean, it's a binary event. It's either going to happen or it's not. So, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put all your eggs on, you know, this happening and, and Tesla doubling, you know, based on this, this one item. I do yeah. think the current business, you know, maybe we can talk about this in a minute, but I, I do think the current business is uh, just kind of like hardware sales uh, from, from the vehicles is a good backstop to the current valuation. Um, but you, you have crazy upside in, in my mind of, of, you know, being able to, if, if this technology proves out and there's a whole lot of reasons, I think it will, um, you know, but, but, you know, maybe, maybe two years, maybe three somewhere, but I think probably but within, think within it's five, I would say it's five. No, I, I don't think so. Uh, okay. I, I mean, there's, cause I just, I'm used to, you know, the bureaucracy of government being like, Oh, you know, it's kind of like getting a permit when you're trying to renovate your house, just takes twice as long as you might expect it to otherwise. Um, but maybe with uh, you know the the climate focus these days, um, some of this stuff gets accelerated. What what would you say? I mean, like, look, I, I would I would agree directionally that if robo taxis that you know that technology becomes usable and 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 is approved by the government, and Tesla is the only um, like robo taxi provider out there, uh, that that would be a huge you know, uh, sort of positive lift for the, for the stock. Um, but uh, what competitive threats do you see in that market? Like, do, do you consider Google or, you know, through Waymo, do you consider Waymo a, a serious threat to, to Tesla from, from just an autonomy standpoint? And if not them, um, have you looked at um, some of the stuff going on in China with, with Baidu and some of the other folks that are, you know, investing heavily into, into autonomous, uh, vehicles. I'll take a real quick first stab at that. So first you mentioned like if the government approves it, I would say, um, I think it's a, a local state by state thing. Um, unless legislators uh, come together and say it's not allowed and pass some law last minute saying, uh, you know, self driving is not going to be allowed. It's, it's, we've done some analysis, it's more of a state by state thing, like in Florida, I think is going to be pretty aggressive about letting it happen my, around Miami, the what mayors even said he wants to encourage robo taxis there first, perhaps. So as long as some states allow it first, I think the other states will catch on quick because they want to be at the, 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 the tipping point of, you know, competitive technology as well. Um, and in terms of com competition, you already see actually in San Francisco, I think Cruz uh set up their uh robo taxi got approval to run their robo taxis to be fully self-driving the problem is it's you know number one it's a multi-sensor approach you know which is messy in terms of building a lot of cars like that in a cost-effective way but the bigger problem is it's geo-fenced and they only allow it for a certain time from like 10 p.m at night to like 4 a.m in the morning when there's like no one else on the road so it's kind of you know this very confined set of criteria that are being allowed in certain areas already by the perceived competition, whether it's, you know, Cruise or Waymo. Um, I think China is probably the closest to being an actual competitor with Tesla on this technology. It seems like we, you know, Matt and I, in our channel, we interviewed a guy, uh, Taylor Ogan, who's, you know, uh, studies the Chinese markets very closely in the self-driving competition. He made some really good cases for, like you said, um, uh, Neo and uh, Xpeng and some others that are doing self-driving. You know, I think China is going to be at the forefront of electric vehicles and autonomous driving, maybe more so than the U.S. in the next five years. But it doesn't. I think there's room for multiple players in China as well as in the U.S. And it's such a huge market that Tesla, you know, doesn't need to capture all the market share of EVs or autonomous driving, they can capture, you know, 20% of it like Apple does with the, you know, phones at the highest margins and do very well. It's possible Tesla captures much more of that in autonomous driving and robo taxis in the US, we think, um, given that they're, they have a very unique approach that no one else is using with vision only. Um, and they're not geofencing, you know, they're not, because of their philosophical approach in, 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 in solving self-driving, they're not going to be geofenced. You know, all the other competitors are basically geofencing themselves in a certain locations that they micro map. And sometimes when there's something strange going on in construction, it shuts them down, or there's a big, you know, um, issue going on in San Francisco recently where all the Waymo cars were driving into this one dead end street over and over. And the neighbors were like, why are all these Waymo cars driving this dead end street? And there was like 
because their geofence micro maps were all screwy for that day or whatever for that. But, that but from, a, from a pure technology standpoint, um, like who is the most advanced player in terms of having the technology necessary to enable self-driving? Like where, like I don't know personally, like the answer to this, but like where does Waymo stand from a technical superiority standpoint versus say Tesla versus, you know, Baidu or Neo or some of these Chinese names, like, is there a clear number one or is it just like they're all doing their own thing and there's not a yeah. lot of transparency or data around who's doing it best? I think other I think than Tesla, I'll let you go in a second, man, but other than Tesla, the only other clear person in the right direction, I think is comma.ai, which is George Hotz. You know, I don't know if you know, George Hotz is the guy who first cracked the iPhone when he was a teenager. He's come up with this self-driving car company called comma.ai. Um, and I think his company is solving self-driving in a similar philosophical approach to Tesla with the vision only stack um, for the most part. But uh, the others are doing a, a, the other approach where they're doing multi-sensors. They're doing, you know, LIDAR, vision, radar, you know, ultrasonic sensor. You know, they're doing all this combining that sensor approach to try to create a signal for to make quick decisions on and it's getting messy. And, um, but anyway, so Matt. With, uh, with Tesla, um, with vision only, I've heard this too. They don't use LIDAR for whatever reason. Um, what, what happens when it's, uh, you know, I don't know. There's a there's a there's a snowstorm going on or just something that would be a, a problem for a traditional camera. Well, you have to think so, about it. How do our eyes perceive when there's a snowstorm? Like, what do we do? It's going to react the same way that we do as humans with eyes, except there's eight eyes that have better focus. You know, they're constantly they're never looking at a cell phone text message. There's eight eyes constantly looking at. So it's it's sort of like the same way humans can drive you know, just using our eyes, that's how the Teslas will. But if there's some condition like a sandstorm or something that obviously a human eye can't drive and then the Tesla would not drive in that condition either. Yeah, and, and maybe just to kind of piggyback on that, that Divya, um, you know, if you are to say, you know, is a, is a Waymo more capable of driving, you know, at least within their geofenced area in Chandler, Arizona, the Waymo is more capable today than, than the Tesla is. Um, but as an investor, you know, I think the important thing to, to do is to look forward and say, okay, which, which approach is scalable? And, you know, the, the, the Waymos are basically, you know, Chrysler Pacificas that are retrofitted in a pretty expensive way with a lot of extra sensors. And then, you know, they've got like these, these driver crews that are kind of going around ready to rescue people. You know, people get stuck in these every once in a while and the car just can't figure out what to do. And then they have to kind of, you know, be rescued by somebody waiting in like a support car. Um, so, you know, Google can fund all this because they've got, you know, all the cash in the world. So, you know, Google's been funding Waymo um, to, to kind of continue to get the technology better. And, and, you know, admittedly, in Chandler, Arizona, that is a better driverless car than, than any Tesla today. Uh, but what Tesla is doing uh, with its, its fleet of over a million cars, um, and every time, you know, I take over from full self-driving, I have the, the beta version of the self-driving software right now, and it makes mistakes all the time. Um, but I'm training the car uh, to get better every time I take over and send that data back. Do, to, the, to do the people who, because I know I've looked this up on their website, like if you, if you pay that, I think it's, is it 10 grand for FSD right now? Yeah. As, yeah. If you pay the 10 grand, um, it, it's obviously it's not going to drive itself, but Tesla is acquiring data to help hone its technology. If you don't pay for FSD, does Tesla still get your driving data to help train its, you know, its autonomous systems? Yeah, yeah. So that you know, they they have this functionality which they call kind of shadow mode, uh, which is you know they they can um, see how how the the car would have driven and compare that to the way that the driver actually drove. So you you probably get a less rich uh, data set because. You know, what, what's most valuable to Tesla is disengagement. So, you know, what they're trying to solve right now is city street driving. That's the, that's like the, the holy grail of self-driving is if you can solve city driving, um, you know, reliably and safely, more safe than a human, then, then you basically cracked it. Um, but uh, if you don't have full self-driving, then the car is not going to try to, to drive. So you, you don't have those, those data points on those, that set of vehicles that are going to be as valuable. You can still get some data, uh, but I think for the most part, what they're actually relying on 
is the is the drivers that have full self-driving and th there's enough now that have that um that it's not a, a huge data loss for them they've got frankly more data than they can, can really manage right now yeah it, now if you strip out self-driving just kind of imagine the, the the sort of the electric the electric the electrified car without the the autonomous driving functionality um wh what are they doing to kind of stay ahead of the curve in terms of um the other aspects of of what you need in a car like i think when tesla first came out people were awed by just the acceleration times like that was mm -hmm. I, I mean i don't own a tesla but i i just remember kind of being somewhat astonished by <laughs> you know the, the numbers and you know i feel like that um there's diminishing return to that because like do people care about the incremental let's say half a second going, you know, do I hit zero to 60 in three seconds or 2.6 seconds? Like <laughs> and now, and now that you're doing, you know, with, with the, the plaid mode, whatever it's doing, you know, 2.4 seconds is whatever the number is like, you know, it's not, it's probably not that useful to get from say two five to two zero or two zero to, you know, like it's, these yeah. are almost ridiculous. You know, it's like, you don't want to be, um, at every, you know, at every stoplight taking off like a, an NHRA, you know, um, you know, drag racer or something like that. Um, so like what else can they do with, with the car outside of self-driving that would make it, um, you know, potentially a more enticing vehicle relative to, you know, uh, a Range Rover or um, just another luxury car? Is there something else that they're doing? Yeah, I would say, you know, as with all EVs, never having to go to a gas station again is a huge benefit. You don't realize until you drive an electric vehicle that like, hey, it's nice never having to go to a gas station again. You just drive it home and it's plugged in at night like your cell phone and it's full every morning. And, you know, 300, my car is 300, my Tesla is 330 miles of range every morning when I start. I never drive more than 100 miles in a day, but I still plug it in at night. If I do drive in a long road trip, there's a superchargers which are pretty, which are pretty quick. But just never having to go to a gas station, never needing servicing. I've had a couple flat tires. Other than flat tires, I've never needed any servicing with my Teslas. And when I do get a flat tire, I can call Tesla service. They send a tow truck with a spare tire immediately and fix it within an hour, just like AAA would or whatever. Um, and then you have the mobile app on your phone with Tesla, you know, and Mobile app is very helpful. Like, for example, if it's cold in the winter, when I used to live in Connecticut, I used to live near you in, in Stanford, Connecticut. In the winter, I could heat up the car like 10 minutes with my mobile app before I get in the car so it's nice and warm. Or air conditioning, I can turn on the air conditioning 10 minutes before I get in the car if it's a hot summer day so it's nice and yeah. cool when I get in. There's also the media, media infotainment. I mean, a Tesla is really a computer on wheels. People say car versus car, it's electric car versus like. It's sort of like the internal combustion engine cars are like, you know, ovens and the electric vehicles are like refrigerators. They're completely different machines. They look a little similar or whatever, but they're incredibly different in terms of producing them, the, what's needed. It, it, the best way to think of a Tesla is like a big computer on wheels. So you have this huge infotainment screen and me and my, my wife and I, we go on like date nights sometimes, especially during COVID, for example, we'll pull up to a restaurant, get food to go and we sit in our car and we'll watch like some cool Netflix show on our car with the incredible sound system and the incredible giant screen, which is incredible. You know, it's like, wow, you have your own home theater system, which is better than a movie theater with the sound system and all that, you know, so there's yeah. so many yeah. Tesla and you get these over the air updates that continuously improve the, the, the car. You know, the over the air update is something I'm like kind of amazed that the other, you know, the rest of the auto industry hasn't caught up to yet um what what so what's the base case valuation on tesla matt you want to take that one yeah so um yeah one quick sideline before i dive into that you know i think a lot of the people who have shorted tesla like have misconceptions about the car and the experience so i would just really encourage anyone who who is short or is thinking about going short just drive a tesla for a week just to so that you are are better informed because uh, it really is just a, it's shocking how different the driving experience is and in, in the entire ownership experience even. Um, so, you know, that's something I think a lot of the shorts that, that I've spoken to and, and kind of heard of over the years haven't taken the time to really diligence the company by owning or by trying the product. 
So that's something I would encourage anyone to, to do, um, just because I, I think it's it's such a, a completely different experience. Um, you know, but in, in terms of you know the the base case valuation, so I did a, like a discounted some of the parts discounted cash flow uh, valuation uh, earlier this year. Um, if you include the autonomy and uh, aspect of it, it, I was coming up with a, a valuation of two thousand nine hundred dollars per share. Uh, now that's um, you, you need to back off probably around uh, $1,400 per share or so from that um, if you don't want to give any credit whatsoever to autonomy. Um, and there's a, there's a mix between you know, being able to charge more for full self-driving as well as the network effects that, or the, the, the Tesla network you know, income that they'd have from being that kind of robo-taxi platform. So there's, there's two different revenue streams really, which, which I think are, are pretty important. Um, so, so backing out that completely would get you to around $1,500 per share. Um, but that is, I think it's not really a base case in that, in that case, because you're giving zero value for, you know, like we were saying, an option. Um, that's, I think that's an interesting exercise. So you get rid of FSD completely. You still get to a $1,500 stock price. Is yeah, that what well, I'm not, not getting rid of it completely. So, so if you think of full self-driving, as uh, what it is today, which which the is really driver just, assistance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's an ADAS system, um, and and so the fact that you know you're looking at Tesla right now, um, they've got over 30 percent automotive gross margins, and they're they're not recognizing about 42 percent of the revenue from from those sales. So um, the take and rate only what, is 18, only 18 percent of the people are taking the full self driving, right? Yeah, yeah. Take rate is it's they don't disclose it, so I'm trying to kind of back engineer it by by digging through the financials. But what I'm coming up with is is around an 18 percent kind of global take rate for full self driving, well. and and only um, like 58 percent of it roughly is recognizable as gap revenue. So all their historical income so statements that's, that's because there's no real timeline on when it would work is that is that the gap rule well, it's, not, exactly. it's not the timeline it, it, they have to actually deliver the functionality so you know uh, is that no timeline or yeah. they haven't delivered it yet yeah you know you're right though did yeah but anyway it's, it's basically a deferred revenue on their PL or on their other yeah, so, so it's accruing it's it's like 1.8 billion dollars roughly of uh of a de deferred revenue liability on their balance sheet right now so you know at some point they're gonna they're gonna recognize a good chunk of that probably in q1 i would guess but you know we'll see um, and it, it would be just, just, just this, these are first. dumb questions, but if, if I opt in to FSD and I pay the 10 grand, mm -hmm. what, like, do I get anything for that? Like, do I get some sort of enhanced cruise control functionality or is it just like this option that I'm buying? Like if one day FSD or, you know, full <laughs> self drive becomes, um, a real thing, then, then I can take advantage of it. But if not, it's just, I just paid 10 grand on the hopes that it works. Well, you lock you lock in two things, Matt. You can add to it too. But my understanding is you 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 lock in a price for yourself because the understanding or the, the implication is that when Tesla does deliver it and and widely release it, that almost instantly overnight they're going to increase that price to like twenty thousand or something, you know, crazy high. Um, and so you're locking in a price at ten thousand now. But the other thing is you're actually getting a more advanced driver assistant features such as navigate on autopilot on the highways, for example, which is very valuable. I use it a lot to go to the airport in San Francisco, which you have to navigate all these highway turns. And on the highway, I've heard, and I use it all the time, the, the Tesla autopilot is by far the best, better than you know GM's Blue Cruise or whatever you call it, better than all the others. You know, it's by far the best on the highway. Like on the highway, I don't even drive. Like I just let the car do its thing. It's already a robo taxi for me on the highway. It's like all my yeah. highway. Do you, do you have so to touch the steering wheel every 10 seconds or every minute or? Yeah, you know, you know, you do have to do that. But what you can do is you can just hold your hand on the steering wheel like this and kind of rest it the whole time. And it, it lets you do it like you're holding your yeah. hand on. But you, you want to be painted. You know, you're always looking at peripheral and making sure that there's nothing yeah. Yeah, yeah. crazy going on. And it alerts you if there's something strange going on that it wants you to take over on. But that doesn't happen very often. Yeah. Yeah. So, so all the cars do have, you know, what they call autopilot, which is basically, you know, it'll stay in the lane on the highway and, you know, keep a distance with the car in front of you. But the, the thing that you get right now, which is really valuable, I just did a, like a 18 hour road trip in a Tesla for the first time about a month ago. And it was incredibly valuable. So it has, you know, what Emmett said, navigate on autopilot. So like, is the minute you get onto the highway on ramp, you can turn on full self-driving. It will merge with the oncoming traffic. 
it will pass the slower cars automatically. It'll just change the lanes by itself. Like some, it's just, it's just a very strange experience to be sitting there in the car and be like, oh, we're doing a lane change now. Yeah. And so you check over there and like, yeah, we're clear. And you're like, yeah, I guess we're going a little slow here. We probably should pass this car. And it'll handle all the interchanges for you. It, it like navigates and drives for you. And that's, you know, I think a lot of people think of luxury in cars. They think of, you know, like having nice leather and nice knobs and like a really great center console. Um, but I think there's this new form of luxury, which is just, you know, convenience of, of like a, a much better driving experience. So, you well, know, it's a more relaxing drive way more, you, for, and I think yeah. you don't realize how much like mental processing power you use on a long drive like that, you know, just like constantly monitoring the situation and even like guiding within a lane and just keeping steady yeah. in there. That's a yeah. surprisingly taxing mental experience when you're doing it for a long time. And yeah, it's, we've moved a long way from, uh, you know, Flintstones. We're, uh, <laughs> you're really just yeah, zero to 60 on those was, was really yeah. bad. <laughs> so, um, now what would you say to the, to the, you know, a lot of the bears talk about, um, you know, credits that they receive as, as sort of, uh, yeah, you know, this artificial cash flow benefit they get and that going away and all, like, what's your take on that? Like, I mean, as far as how sustainable the business is without all those, without all the tax credits, carbon credits. Yeah, I mean, last quarter it was only two hundred million dollars of of um, tax credits, or of uh, you know, um, it's a combination of like the zero emission vehicle credit and and so some credits in, in other regulatory uh, regimes. So you know, it declined pretty significantly, uh, you know, quarter over quarter. Um, so as we model out the business, we we do kind of assume that those taper off. So you know, when I'm coming up with these valuations, that I'm sure a lot of the viewers will think are crazy. You know, twenty nine hundred dollars or you know, more conservatively, fifteen hundred dollars. I assume those go away. Um, I, I think a lot of the the difficult financial modeling that a lot of folks haven't taken the time to do is to just really hack apart the financials and say, let's back out credits, let's back out um, full self driving, you know, recognition, and just get to what I call the the core manufacturing margin of Tesla. And so when you do that, and when you track that over time. Uh, it, it's uh, amazing how how um, efficient they've become over time. They, they, they've gotten way better than I thought they would in, in just how uh, profitably they can actually do their manufacturing. Um, I would say that they're, they're the industry leaders right now. And, and a lot of that is the design. They, they, they focused on really minimalistic designs and they've driven down battery and, and drivetrain costs um, so, so drastically now that, that you're getting, you know, margins just on the manufacturing process of around 20%, which is, you know, like best in class. And then on top of that, you layer in credits, at least for right now. And then, uh, the real opportunity is that la layering in full self-driving on top of that manufacturing efficiency. So anyone who's, who's going to kind of criticize credits, um, sure, but you need to do the harder work of, of really picking apart the financials in, in more detail, um, yeah. and, and track how they've improved that over time. Uh, what, now, what is the like Kathy Wood take on this? Is it is it also the same sort of robo taxi sort of future? Is that is that pretty much the basis of their thesis as well? Yeah, I mean um, that that is. I mean, I forget what their price target is right now. Do you remember Emmett? Three thousand, I think. Three thousand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they, they published their their model, and it does include. Um, they did like a Monte Carlo simulation. So, you know, they've got scenarios without any, you know, autonomy. And then they've got scenarios with, you know, like super aggressive autonomy assumptions. And so I think it was like 10,000 different scenarios and they kind of average come together. Um, and you guys, you guys just play it by like basically just buying long-term calls. Is that kind of how you express the, the viewpoint? Well, we did, we did that early on uh, when I started the incubator fund. And then last year after the run up to like $900, you know, when we close out of some of the, the shorter term calls for the S and P inclusion bet we put on, then we had a bunch of shares. We took assignment on some of the calls too. And we converted, you know, we felt that it would be range bound for a while after the fast run up. So, you know, instead of buying long-term calls, we didn't think that was a great as great a risk reward. So we ended up selling deep in the money puts. So when mm -hmm. Tesla was around six hundred or seven hundred dollars a share, we converted our shares into selling for every like hundred shares or for, for every hundred shares of Tesla we owned, we ended up selling thousand uh, dollar strike puts for June of twenty twenty two, or no June of twenty twenty three. Yeah, thousand strike puts for June of twenty twenty three for like five hundred dollars. So we sold like three of those put options for every, for every uh, share. So if we did the we did the math. 
And we realized that, okay, if Tesla, you know, as long as Tesla is above $500 a share come June of 2023, we're going to make money on this trade. We're extremely confident of that. And if Tesla goes above $1,000 a share by June of 2023, we maximize a return of, you know, 67% for two years in a row, which is like you know, almost 200% return over, you know, two years. And, um, we're, you know, it, worst case for us is if Tesla runs up to $2,000 plus a share, we would have made more money just holding the stock. But we weren't as confident that Tesla would run up from like, you know, five or $600 or $700 up to $2,000 a share in a year and a half at that time. Although now it seems like more likely, obviously, but those puts were turned out to be a really good trade. And, and uh, you know, I think they're trading around $220 a put now. So we've made a good amount of money on that. Um, and we'll probably close those out when they're close to $100 or something like that at some point. And, 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 we've, and along the way, since then, we've also re-upped our long-term call options at opportunistic times. So, you know, we don't, the shares, yeah, we own some, uh, some shares, but uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity for upside returns when you use the options on such a disruptive stock like tes Tesla. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, moving on from Tesla, um, let's talk a little bit about crypto. Um, so your fund obviously is, is equity focused. Um, so I take it you guys don't have any direct crypto positions, is that right? That's right. We're not allowed to invest in crypto directly. Got it. So um, uh, maybe just walk me through kind of like how you approach, you know, I feel like crypto is affecting so much of the markets. I mean, it's certainly big tech, obviously the payment sector, um, you know, everything from Square and PayPal to, you know, Facebook, now Meta. And then, you know, now we have, there are also exchanges like Coinbase that are public. Um, where are you seeing the best kind of opportunity to get exposure to crypto through the equity markets? Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, Coinbase seems like a, a good um, uh, proxy, you know, as a stock to cover a lot of crypto and soon to be NFTs. You know, they've announced uh, uh, their capability for NFT and NFT marketplace shortly and ginormous interest in that. So Coinbase is a nice kind of overall proxy, I think, for just the whole crypto economy in general, in a lot of ways, we think. Um, there are competitors, you know, I think FTX is a up and coming exchange that could really uh, compete and perhaps take over the top spot in the US as well. I think they're more popular overseas still at the moment. But um, so I don't know if Coinbase is going to be the, the top player, but I think they'll be around. Um, do you guys have um, exposure to FTX? Do you, do you like, is it still private? No. We have FTX is still private. They do have some like DAO tokens, but I don't think U.S. investors are allowed to invest in it or, or whatnot. But, you know, we would love to get exposure if they were publicly traded, uh, obviously, I think, to some FTX uh, shares. But around crypto, around Bitcoin, you know, we've been interested in Bitcoin. I've been following Bitcoin and bought some, my first Bitcoin in 2011, a small amount, but I lost half of it on Mount Gox in 2013, I remember. And um oh, so you're, I, you're you were like a frontiersman on the bitcoin yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay yeah. i didn't realize it was it was uh, that you were a mount gox guy that's that's cool yeah yeah i even i remember i, I made a claim uh for mount gox and fortress the hedge fund bought my claim from me <laughs> i sold it for them two years ago i wish i didn't sell to them now but uh or three years ago i sold to them but um i still have half my bitcoin from way back then which wasn't much you know back in 2011 a thousand dollar investment coin was a lot of money to me back then. And I was filing Tesla back then too. And so I've been on these for a long time, but in terms of our fund and what, what we're doing around that, we, 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 there's some stocks out there that are sort of, we view as proxies of Bitcoin or, or really good proxies or, or derivatives in a way of Bitcoin, like micro strategy. And we sort of identified a unique uh, strategy where uh, we're, we, we are bullish on Bitcoin. Uh, we think it's going to be at least range bound and maybe appreciate continuously, uh, slowly, but surely. And so we're, we're, but we think it'll be volatile. And then you have micro strategy as a proxy or derivative on Bitcoin itself. And that, that means it's even more volatile. So what we're doing is we're selling options or we're selling derivatives on the derivative of Bitcoin in a way we're selling options around micro strategy in a way that if Bitcoin um, bounces around, then MicroStrategy will bounce around, you know, in a wider distribution, but we'll make a good amount of money on selling that volatility. And if Bitcoin goes up, we'll make a good amount of money, but not as much as if we just held Bitcoin. 
Bitcoin goes down, we lose a little bit of money, but not nearly as much as if if, uh, if we just held Bitcoin only or, or whatnot. I yeah. Think I, I, but Matt, do you want to talk a little bit more about the strategy? Matt's been really a good uh, point of uh, expertise on this. Yeah. So you know, we're, we're I think we're we're bullish on Bitcoin, but we're we're by no means like Bitcoin maximalists. So you know, you, you'll not find us with like laser eyes in our Twitter profile or you know, <laughs> saying it's going to get to like a million dollars, you know, right. next year or anything like that. But so you know, we we obviously buy a lot of options, and so we're, we're very kind of aware of you know implied volatility and, and what that does to options pricing. So you know what we've what we've seen with with micro strategy, where like roughly ninety percent or so of the market cap is attributable to their you know Bitcoin holdings on the balance sheet uh, on a fair market value basis. So you know as, as Bitcoin bounces around, you know uh, micro strategy has you know kind of crazy implied volatility. So, you know, we'll sell puts up to a certain amount. And then if, if um, you know, the, if the stock, you know, kind of moves against those puts, then we'll take delivery of the shares. And then, you know, we can sell co covered calls essentially uh, against those shares. And so, we, you know, we're essentially selling volatility on the way up and on the way down in order to, to generate some premium kind of along the way. And it's, it's been a, a really good way to kind of take advantage of, um, you know, options pricing and just the volatility in general while having like a relatively mildly, you know, uh, long exposure to, to Bitcoin. So I don't follow micro strategies personally too closely, but um, have you ever seen a situation where the value of their Bitcoin holdings exceeded the market cap? Yeah. Yeah. Earlier this year. Uh, so we actually track this on a, on a daily basis and that kind of informed some of our trading strategy. Um, but they were, I forget the exact number, but, but they, they traded up like north of $1,400 per share. Um, and that was, you know, like something like 50%, uh, higher than the, than the value of their Bitcoin holdings. Um, and if, if you know anything about the, the company, I mean, their, their core business is like maybe worth a billion, uh, probably less than that. Um, so their operating the business opposite, almost, where the, where their Bitcoin holdings were worth more than the company, more than the actual oh, market. Oh no! no. Uh, I mean, it's. It, it, I don't think we've seen it more. Um, it's touched. Than the it's touched a tiny bit. Of, it's been about a hundred. It's been about equal, or it's gone up slightly temporarily, but uh, recently, I think actually. But yeah, I think it, it's never exceeded more than a hundred percent, or more than a yeah. day or two. But you will see situations where the market cap is a lot higher than its Bitcoin holdings. I, so you saw that earlier this year. I don't think that's going to happen again. I think the market has kind of wised up. It, it seems to me that they're moving relatively close in tandem. It's not a perfect correlation. Yeah. Um, but I think there's enough people that must be doing a, a strategy similar to us now um, yeah. where you won't. I, I'd be shocked if there's a, that big of a disconnect again, but it yeah. could happen. Yeah. Another um, stock that does something similar is Riot Blockchain. You know, Riot Blockchain. There's others out there too, but there's a number of proxy companies to pick up. Um, so um, lastly, and this sort of relates to um, to, uh, to to crypto um, on the on the the metaverse front. Uh, I know, I'm sure you guys are active in Roblox and so, but I'm just curious what yeah. what are your favorite plays there? We've been in Roblox for a while. We've been in it since the direct listing day. Actually, we bought a, a significant piece of our fund into Roblox. It's been you know, you know, there's like four or five core stocks and Roblox has been one since the direct listing date. And uh, we we hold a, a significant amount of shares and long term call options. You know, we view Roblox as, you know, a slice of the metaverse inevitable, um, inevitably. And basically it's a platform, not a game itself. It's a platform or an app store, you know, sort of like the app store for Apple for a bunch of different developers to come and develop their own experiences. That's what we view Roblox as sort of like a platform or an app store for hundreds of thousands of developers that are currently using it to be developing their own kind of experiences, you know, whether they're games or social experiences is questionable. There's lots of gray area in between, but they're creating tons of these experiences that has, you know, I think 40 or 50 million daily active users now. It's like a flywheel. So the better the content, the more daily active users, the more daily active users, the more developers come on board to create more content. And it just keeps, it's just a self-fulfilling loop that's just growing. And it's like, I don't see anyone else competing with them in that space at this point. And uh, it just seems like it's inevitable to be a big slice of the, of the uh, metaverse uh, in our view. And, you know, we feel highly vindicated in the recent earnings report, which is good. And, you know, we think the stock has a lot more room to run. It's 50 or 60 billion market cap, but we think it could be, you know, hundred to 200 billion market cap easily in a year or two. 
Do you, do you um, follow Unity as well? Uh, to some degree. Unity, um, I think, is also a potential play. We haven't invested ourselves in it. Uh, I think at one point we had some stock uh, shortly after it went public um, and sold it for a gain, but we haven't really dug as deep into it as we have with Roblox. Um, Unity, I think, has a nice you know, software platform for a lot of mobile gaming and, and you know, but I just don't think it's as eco and it's an ecosystem like Roblox. Ro Roblox is like what one blogger called it as a company town, not just like an ecosystem, like a company town they've built. And I don't think Unity is as inclusive for all the developers and users. It's kind of like built this technology that developers can build upon and many are using, but I just don't know if that's as big of a moat for them as what Roblox has developed. So would you say that um, kind of the Oculus sort of app ecosystem would be a competitor to Roblox or is that, how would you rate, how would you compare those two? Yeah, I mean, Oculus is sort of hardware. I, I would say the metaverse is not necessarily a hardware driven thing. I think, you know, you'll have some devices, uh, um, you know, new devices built, whether it's Snapchat, uh, the, the goggle spectacles or Oculus, you know, by Facebook or whatever. But I think a lot of these companies, whether it's Roblox or uh, Unity or Fortnite, Epic Games with Fortnite and such, I think they'll build out their capabilities to be accessible by all widely used plat uh, hardware. So eventually Roblox will be, pretty soon we're talking about Roblox being available on Nintendo Switch maybe, that would be a huge win. Um, but also I think uh, eventually if Oculus heats up enough, you'd have more Roblox accessibility through the Oculus platform. Because I think Mark Zuckerberg even, most of the people that are getting involved in the metaverse now are, are acknowledging that it needs to be more open source and capable, you know, open to all kinds of developers and users. They don't want to make it a closed ecosystem. Although that's sort of what Roblox has done, but I think the Roblox will let their closed sort of their company town ecosystem be available on all the different platforms they can. Yeah. Um, awesome, guys. This is great. Listen, I, I'm going to be, uh, follow, I mean, I follow all these names and, and um, you know, at some point we should catch up again and, and hear how some of these trades played out. Tesla's yes. like, one, like just unending sagas that <laughs> people <laughs> never get tired of talking about. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, it's funny. It's funny. We talk about the bears, the way they talk about Tesla, they have, that's kind of how Matt and I and, and many of us in our circle talk about Rivian and Lucid right now. And we haven't personally driven a Rivian or a Lucid yet. We're so tempted to short it and buy puts on it. So we're yeah. kind of like at the other well, end. Well, the funny thing about Rivian is that, you know, like people just make these almost blanket. Oh, well, it's a, you know, $80 billion market cap. So much, it's like so much less than Tesla. And, <laughs> and so let's just buy Rivian, you know. Um, it's like 140 now though, so that yeah. math isn't working out. Yeah, so well. today. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's now 140. Okay. Um, Lucid. I, I, what's the mark cap of Lucid? Because that, that's like even 75 billion somewhere. No, 87 probably billion more now. at this moment. Lucid today wow. is up 20 percent. 87 billion. Rivian is 143, 144 billion as we speak. I mean, all of these numbers to me just seem like. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, maybe this because like I grew up working <laughs> on an actual fund. No, but, you're not alone. You're not alone. They're crazy. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, the fact that the wealthiest man in the I think Elon Musk is worth like two hundred fifty billion dollars now. I mean, just yeah, numbers are so stratospheric that you start to like lose any sense of um, I mean, they just seem untethered from from planet Earth, uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And, and, and it's yeah. just, just, you know, part of me is just like, wow, like, you know, years and years of, of money printing kind of creating these, you know, the, the, these, these valuations. Um, and it's, it's like, if you go into anything that's exciting, you end up, people talk about a 10 times sales multiple as if it's just normal. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> like, oh yeah. Like that company's worth 10 times revenue, 20 times revenue. Um, but I guess that's, that's the world we live in. Um, um, but yeah, listen, guys, we'll, we'll certainly keep in touch. I, I'd, I'd love to follow up on a lot of these names. Um, and Roblox, I think, is definitely one that um, is starting to get a lot of attention. Uh, I don't think most people are familiar with their, the, you know, the actual service, but um, uh, they certainly have an ecosystem that's in the works, that's thriving, and, you know, they, they've done really well. Um, so we'd love yeah. to follow up with you guys on that. And, um, you know, thanks again for taking the time. This is great. Really learned a lot. 
Yeah, thanks, Divya. We had a good time chatting, and uh, we love your service with Sub Zero, and uh, look forward to participating more as time goes on. Hopefully, appreciate it.